Hi, Todd Dunn here for Life on the Edge. This video is the third in my series of videos on chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL. In this video I'm going to be talking about prognostic factors and outlook for someone who has the disease. And again I want to stress that I am myself a CLL patient. So I want to say one other thing before we get started and that's that this presentation is going to be a little different than the last couple in that I'm going to be pasting audio onto a series of slides so you don't have to look at my rather monotonous uh, face during the presentation. So if you like this style as opposed to me sitting there and talking, uh, let me know in the comments. Okay, let's get started. As you're no doubt finding out, CLL is a complex disease. It's characterized by lots of genetic variation between the different styles of the disease. In addition, there are lots of different prognostic factors and there are a wide range of prognoses for an individual who has the disease depending on the particular characteristics of their individual CLL. As a consequence, it's very difficult to talk about the disease in general. You have to have the genetic and other information about your particular disease to be able to really have a good idea of what you as an individual can expect. Now let's talk about the genetic variation in CLL. First off, all CLL B lymphocytes are mutated com when compared to normal B lymphocytes. Uh, second, CLLB lymphocytes are generally monoclonal, but it's possible for you to have multiple clones of mutated B lymphocytes. In other words, multiple variants of CLL. Not all genetic variants of CLL are known to have prognostic value. There are many variants, many genetic mutations that can be found in CLL but not all of them have been found to be significant in terms of understanding the progression of the disease, at least not yet. And finally, over time, the genetic variant, the particular mutation that you have, can change, particularly after treatment, uh, if the treatment involves chemotherapy. And it's now starting to look like it can also change after treatment with targeted therapies. Now I'd like to talk about the CLL genetic variants that have been found to have prognostic value. I'm going to address these from the variant with the best prognosis through to the variant that has been found to have the worst prognosis. So let's get started. The best prognosis is for a genetic variant called a 13Q deletion. This is a deletion of part of the long arm of chromosome 13. Overall, as I said, this has the best prognosis, but how good it is depends a little bit on just how big the deletion is. If more than about 60% of the B cells have the 13Q deletion, that generally gives a worse prognosis than if only a small percentage of cells have the 13Q deletion. In addition, for 13Q, if that's the only de uh, genetic variant that is found amongst the prognostic variants, it's about 30 percent of the people with that variant may not need treatment at all. They'll have CLL, but Basically, it will never get to the point where they need treatment. The next genetic variant is called trisomy 12. What this means is that there is an extra copy of chromosome 12 present. In other words, in the cell there are three copies of the chromosome instead of two. This gives a generally good prognosis, but compared to the other genetic variants, it does cause a slightly higher 
possibility of what's called a Richter's transformation. A Richter's transformation is occurs when your CLL changes to a much more aggressive leukemia called diffuse large B cell lymphoma and the prognosis for that is really bad. I mean we're talking a year or less in life expectancy with very limited treatment options. However the possibility of that is quite small. Now the next one is normal. Normal simply means that none of the particular genetic variants that were looked for in the test that determines these, which is called a FISH test, none of those were found. It does not mean that the CLL cells are normal because remember they're all mutated. This has a generally good prognosis, a little bit worse than trisomy 12, and a little bit worse than 13Q, but not particularly bad. But why it falls here is not really well understood at this point. Now we're going to get into some of the poorer prognosis markers. The first is the 11Q deletion, which is a deletion of part of the long arm of chromosome 11. This particular variant of CLL is often characterized by what's called bulky disease, where you have developed swollen lymph nodes, sometimes very significantly swollen. And also progression is generally faster than with 13Q trisomy 12 or a normal genetic makeup. This is also the site of the ATM gene, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and it can mean that you will develop chemotherapy resistance. In other words, you could have chemotherapy, it will work a little bit, but you'll get a recurrence of the disease relatively quickly. So 11Q is not a really good prognostic marker. Finally, we come to the 17P deletion. Of the genetic markers, this is by far the worst one. This is a deletion of part of the short arm. That's what the, the P means. I notice I have a typo on the screen. 17P deletion. It's a deletion of part of the short arm of chromosome 17. That generally includes the location of the TP53 gene, which is an important gene if you don't have it or if it's mutated, you gen to tend to be quite resistant to chemotherapy, even more so than with 11Q. And so you might have chemotherapy, but the disease will recur relatively quickly, probably less than a year, and you'll have to look either at repeating chemotherapy or going on to another treatment. Without treatment, the 17P genetic marker tends to be have a pretty bad prognosis with a pretty sh with the shortest life expectancy now let's look at some additional markers with prognostic value I'm gonna talk about these in a couple of groups first off I'm gonna look at those that are commonly tested for the first of those is CD38. CD38 is a particular protein found on the surface of CLL B cells, some CLL B cells. In general, if your this, this particular marker is not found, that's positive. That's a good prognosis. If there are more than about 30% of the CLL cells have the CD38 marker, though, the prognosis is not as good. Another marker is called the ZAP70, and this also is a positive marker if less than about 20% of the CLL cells have this marker, but it's not as good if more than 20% of the cells have this marker. Some markers that are less commonly tested for, but are very important, include IGVH gene mutation. In general, if you have mutated IGVH gene, that's good, particularly if combined with a 13Q deletion, 
as I mentioned early, earlier, about 30% of people with 13Q deletion may not need treatment ever during the progress of the disease. And those people all have mutated IGVH genes. I said this is less commonly tested for because the test is a little bit tricky. So some doctors don't do it until right before treatment. It is, however, a very important test to have done before any treatment is initiated. Another test that is not commonly done, but is becoming more common and probably should be routinely done, is to look for TP53 gene mutation. I mentioned the TP53 gene in, in connection with the 17P deletion. Um, largely because TP53 uh, leads to resistance to chemotherapy if, it's, if the gene has been deleted or if it is mutated. So if you have TP53 mutation, chemotherapy is probably not a good idea for you. So this is more of a marker of value for treatment selection than it is for overall prognosis. Now, let's move on to some novel markers that are normally only tested for in academic settings if your doctor happens to be affiliated with a university or major cancer research center. These include NOTCH1, which is a, a mutation, which has been found in some cases to suggest that you, if you have this mutation, you may be resistant to CD20 antibodies like rituximab or obinutuzumab, etc. Others that are of prognostic value include SF3B1, BRK3, and the and looking for mutations of the ATM gene, which was deleted by in the 11Q deletion. There are a number of others, but I'm not going to go into them because they just become sort of an alphabet soup. There are also some other factors that are of prognostic significance. In particular is, are some clinical factors. By clinical I mean things that your doctor can observe uh, just from blood tests and physical examination. In particular the stage of the disease is important. The stage is expressed either by the RAI stage, R-A-I, which is a variant developed in North America, or the Binet stage, or Binet stage, which is the European version. Uh, I'm going to be talking about RAI staging because I'm in North America, and I will give a brief connection to Binet staging. Okay, in the RAI staging method, there are five stages. They range from 0 to 4. Stage 0 simply means that you have an elevated lymphocyte count and no other clinical features. Your doctor can't find anything else wrong with you other than your CBC blood test showed that you had too many lymphocytes. This is usually a, this is a very early stage of the disease and it's considered low risk. It's con equivalent to Binet stage 1. The next stage is RI stage 1 where you have an elevated lymphocyte count and some swollen lymph nodes. This is generally considered to be medium risk. That's a little bit more disease progression. Generally also associated perhaps with a little bit higher lymphocyte count. Next is Stage 2, where you have an elevated lymphocyte count, swollen lymph nodes, and an enlarged spleen, and possibly an enlarged liver. But remember, the lymph nodes and the spleen are part of the lymphatic system, and B lymphocytes accumulate there. So as your lymphocyte count goes up, you tend to have some swelling in the lymph nodes and enlargement of the spleen. This is also considered medium risk. In general, people with RI stage 0, 1, or 2 CLL would not be considered 
as candidates for treatment. Now let's move on to the high risk categories. These are RISE stages 3 and 4. Stage 3 has all the characteristics of stage 2 plus anemia which is being developed and it, it's important to note that the anemia should not be autoimmune hemolytic anemia in which your B cells are producing antibodies which destroy your red blood cells. It should be anemia as a consequence of a failure of your bone marrow to produce enough red blood cells. And finally, stage four is everything in stage two plus a low platelet count. Again, it's a low platelet count that is not due to autoimmune thrombocytopenia, but to a lack of production of platelets. Identification, definitive identification of stage 3 or stage 4 uh, CLL does require a bone marrow biopsy to determine definitively that the either red blood cells or platelets are not being produced. In general, stages 3 and 4 are high risk. This is equivalent to Binet stage 3 and it is usually meets the criteria for treatment. So if you end up in stage 3 with stage 3 or stage 4 CLL, you're probably going to be looking at treatment sooner rather than later. And finally, a parameter that has some prognostic indication is your age at diagnosis. In general, if you're younger, the prognosis is a little bit better than if you're older. That may be in part because if you're 80 years old, you probably are suffering from some other physical problems, which are called comorbidities, and you may not be eligible for some of the more aggressive treatments and consequently you may simply not live as long. Also, if you're 80 years old, uh, your life expectancy isn't that great. Finally, uh, I'll say one more thing about age and that is that uh, in general CLL is a disease of elderly people the median age at diagnosis is 70 or 71 years of age. So most people that have CLL are older. I'm going to wrap this presentation up by talking a little bit about life ex expectancy in CLL. In other words, you've got CLL. How long can you expect to live? Well, let me start by saying that prior to 2014, with when a number of targeted therapies were approved, uh, in particular drugs like abrutinib, idelalisib, and more recently venetoclax, and also some of the more sophisticated monoclonal antibodies, uh, things were quite different than they are now. If you looked in the literature, you would find that there were median life expectancies published and I've listed the life expectancies that I was able to find as a function of your genetic variant. And they ranged from around 11 years for people with 13Q deletion. Remember these are median life expectancies which means half of the people have a shorter life expectancy and half have a longer life expectancy. For trisomy 12, the published life expectancy was around nine and a half years. For a normal CLL genetically, uh, remember normal just means that none of the other genetic variants were found, um, about nine and a quarter years. For the 11 Q deletion, about six and a half years. And for 17 P, for some reason I kept typing 17 Q when I made up these slides, only 2.7 years, which is one of the reasons that 17P is considered the worst uh, prognostic indicator. However, now in 2017, things have changed a lot, largely as a consequence of the approval of targeted therapies. Survival, overall survival, 
even with bad prognostic markers like 11Q or 17P has been improved quite dramatically. The prognosis for 17P and 11Q still isn't as good as it is for people with the 13Q deletion, trisomy 12, or what's called normal genetics, but it's better than it used to be because these new targeted therapies work quite well even if you have an 11Q or a 17P uh, deletion. As a consequence, cytogenetics, or the determination of your genetic markers, your chromosome deletions, is now used as much for treatment selection as it is for prognosis. In other words, if you have a 17P deletion, because of the resistance that that deletion confers for chemotherapy, you're probably going to move directly to a targeted therapy and not even consider chemotherapy as a treatment. And so that's a big change in what these genetic markers or prognostic factors mean. In addition, there are lots of new treatments in the pipeline, improvements largely in the targeted therapies and they things are looking fairly positive in the clinical research world so if you can hold off on needing treatment it's probably very good. Now I do have to say that CLL remains incurable except possibly maybe for some people with the 13Q deletion. It's been found that one of the chemotherapy regimens, FCR, uh, resulted in about 25 to 30 percent of people with the 13Q deletion who underwent FCR therapy are still treatment free after as much as 16 or 17 years. To some doctors, that is a cure. To others, they're saying, well, we'll wait and see what happens. And of course, remember, these are people who required treatment, not this 30% or so of 13Q deleted CLL patients who probably won't ever need treatment. So if you, it just, it points out that 13Q is quite a positive outlook compared to the other genetic variants. Okay. And that pretty much finishes up what I want to say today. I'm going to move on in my next few talks to other things. Uh, I'm going to put together a presentation on treatments, what I know about them, which one, what the current sort of paradigm for treatment is. I'm also going to put one together on, okay, you've got CLL. What can you expect? both in terms of testing and the old money issue. So thank you very much. I hope that you got something out of this presentation. And bear in mind that some of the things I said were my opinion based on reading and listening to a lot of other presentations by research doctors. And there may be consequently differences between what I think and what other people do. So if you liked the presentation, click the like button. And if you want to get more information about when the next one is coming up, subscribe. And I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you very much.